year was 1938, and World War II was looming like a Martian tripod over a terrified city in H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, was attempting to avert hostilities as Adolf Hitler and his German army of Nazis viewed Europe like the Martians from the aforementioned novel viewed Earth as a place to conquer, occupy and rule. In September of that year, France and Great Britain had signed a document known as the Munich Pact in which a large portion of Czechoslovakia was given over to Hitler and Germany. This, in their misguided view, would be enough to stop an invasion force. It wasn't. On October the 30th, a month to the day after the signing of the Munich Pact, with Americans troubled by reports of such an impending European invasion, the unthinkable happened. America was invaded. However, this wasn't by little green uniformed Nazis, but by actual little green-skinned Martians from Mars. The War of the Worlds preceded World War II, and yet again, H.G. Wells' gift of predicting the future within his writings came to the fore. What started out as a Halloween treat by Orson Welles and his Mercury Theatre on the air who were broadcasting an American audio adaptation of H.G. Wells' 1898 The War of the Worlds novel, turned out to be a Halloween trick. It sounded like a genuine news report, and millions of listeners fled their homes in terror and panic, fearing the worst. The radio broadcast happened on the night before Halloween, popularly known in America as Mischief Night, which is marked by acts of deceit, damage and violence. Never had it become more mischievous than on this particular night and heralded the coming of Halloween and the inevitability of a world at war with its own acts of deceit, damage and violence. Halloween is celebrated on October the 31st and has deep-rooted origins stretching back to when European pagan traditions single it out as a day of religious celebration. Christian missionaries appropriated it, as they also did with Christmas and Easter, and gave it a Christian interpretation. Nevertheless, down through the ages, Halloween has been celebrated by many and varied religions, enjoying a fascinating history. In Norse religion, it was a night when sacrifices were offered to their gods and blessings were given to the harvest and their food. In the Druidic religion of the ancient Celts, Halloween was a harvest festival because of the beginning of the winter season, known as Samhain, falling on November the 1st. Bonfires were lit to dispose of animal bones slaughtered as sacrifices on this night, and the word bonfire is believed to derive from bone fire. As now celebrated by our modern-day pumpkin lanterns, the embers were then given out to the families gathered to take home to create their own fire. This would ward off evil spirits, as many religions believed that this night was a time when the gates would open between this world and the spirit world. <laughs> It was the Roman invasion of Britain that added the wearing of masks and the honouring of the dead to the ancient tradition. However, today, this festival is most celebrated in America, where the tradition of Halloween was first introduced by Irish immigrants in the 19th century. 
H.G. Wells' story of an invasion of Earth seems to fit nicely within the Halloween tradition of beings from another dimension arriving to scare, frighten and take over the human race. This was probably why Orson Welles, the soon-to-be legendary voice of sound, stage and screen, chose it as the one to adapt for his Halloween stunt. But H.G. Wells himself intended it as a prophetic parable, like many of his other novels, and was somewhat shocked at the renewed interest in his work. To begin at the beginning, Herbert George Wells was born on September the 21st, 1866, in the small country town of Bromley in Kent, a London borough in the southeast corner of England that was most famous at that time for being the final resting place of Lady Godiva's husband, Leofric, Earl of Mercia, in 1057. Leofric was the wealthy founder of several notable monasteries, and his wife, Lady Godiva, is said to have rode naked through the city of Coventry, England, in order to persuade her husband to reduce the burden of heavy taxation by King Harthacanute, England's most unpopular monarch. The family that Herbert George was born into lived at house number 47, just off the high street, and were decidedly lower middle class, due mainly to his father's inability to run the shop that he owned. Joseph Wells was a gregarious but often irresponsible character that sold crockery, china and sporting goods at his eclectic shop. He was also a professional cricketer for Bromley Cricket Club and would often spend more time away at the cricket club than with his wife and family. Herbert George Wells was the youngest of three brothers. Frank Wells was the firstborn son of the family and Fred Wells was the second. In 1864, Two years before Herbert became the third brother, the family grieved over the loss of a nine-year-old daughter, Frances Wells, who had been the first child of Joseph and Sarah Wells. Sarah Wells was the domineering matriarch of the Wells family, forcing her brood to adhere to the strict and restricting rules of Victorian society, looking down on those that she felt superior to and looking up to those who were in a higher class than she was. H.G. would grow up to despise this way of thinking and believed that everyone should be equal. She had a very deep religious belief in God and Christianity and this devout calling was forced upon her sons from an early age. H.G. was the only one to rebel against his mother's teachings often referring to God as the old sneak because of his omnipresence. H.G. seemed to delight in completely abandoning his mother's strict views as soon as he could, which must have caused quite a rift between them in later life. Because of her inability to cope with the demands of family life without the aid of a supportive husband, she had a somewhat melancholic and nervous demeanour. This was coupled with a strong sense of wanting her family to appear better than their income would allow. She forbade any of her brood to play with other children in order that their clothes would remain neat and tidy for as long as possible. Unfortunately, Sarah was a poor seamstress and she feared that the children's clothes would quickly show signs of mending making the family look poorer in the eyes of the community. H.G.'s childhood was shaped by his status within the Wells family. Because he was the last child and after the death of their only daughter, Frances, a much-loved replacement for his grieving mother, he became spoilt and precocious. 
This resulted in him being involved in regular altercations with his older brothers and throwing huge tantrums when he didn't get his way. One such tantrum allegedly ended with him throwing a fork which embedded itself in his elder brother's forehead. H.G. Wells' love of literature and words came from a time when he was a virtual invalid after breaking his leg when he was eight. Some stories say this happened after a particularly boisterous bit of inter-sibling wrestling, and others say his father's friend was throwing him in the air and catching him until he missed. Either way, this fortunate accident allowed Wells to indulge in reading book after book that his parents heaped on him to while away the hours. He had a particular interest in stories about battles and wars and of people doing heroic deeds. In the two months of convalescing, the injury taught him two things that crop up time and time again in his later writings. The first was the need to suppress pain, and the second was that religion was of little use in this quest. His initial schooling came from the Thomas Morley Academy, a private school with no more than 30 pupils in his hometown of Bromley. It was run by a man named, appropriately enough, Thomas Morley, who didn't even have a teaching qualification. But, with his nose buried in a textbook, it was here that H.G. Wells' thirst for education was quenched, but it was an all too short period of study for him. In an accident reminiscent of his son's, Joseph Wells fell off a ladder and fractured his thigh. He never fully recovered, and his days as a professional cricketer ended. The earnings he'd brought in as a professional cricketer ceased, effectively bankrupting the family. H.G. Wells was taken out of the academy and, like his older brothers, was sent out to work in order to help support the family. Sarah Wells found a job as a housekeeper at Up Park House, owned by a rich and affluent family. In later years, her husband would take what little money she'd saved to buy a small house near Up Park, whilst his wife lodged at her grand place of work. She sent all three of her sons out into drapery apprenticeships, each with a different draper. A draper is now a largely obsolete term for a merchant who sold cloth or wool, a prosperous industry which Sarah Wells could see her sons and herself profiting from. The oldest son, Frank Wells, eventually became a successful draper before giving it up to become a travelling repairman for watches and clocks. He started his repair business from the new home of his parents near Up Park and would provide for them, as would HG, for the rest of their natural lives. Fred Wells, the middle sibling, also became a successful draper and only left when he was forced out of his deputy manager position by the return of the boss's son. He moved to the town of Johannesburg in South Africa, famed for being the richest place on earth at the time, due to the huge diamond and gold deposits that were unearthed there. Unfortunately, unlike his brothers, H.G. Wells loathed every minute of his apprenticeship to a drapery firm called Rogers and Denyer in Windsor near London, where he lodged in a dormitory with all the other apprentices and the senior shop assistant. He would work for up to ten hours a day, cleaning the shop, running the desk and helping balance the books. His absent-minded nature and the deep loathing he had of his enforced profession eventually got him fired and he yearned to return to education. But HG was marched straight into another apprenticeship 
under the tutorage of Mr Samuel Cowup, owner of a chemist shop, what we'd now call a drugstore, in Church Street, Midhurst, a small market town in West Sussex, England. This time he realised that he'd never amount to anything more than a mere bottle washer and general assistant in the chemist shop because of a need to master the language of Latin used by the doctors for their prescriptions. So, with his customary tenacity and dedication, H.G. Wells became a student of Mr. Horace Byatt, the headmaster of the nearby Midhurst Grammar School and he amazed his teacher by learning Latin in an amazingly short space of time. He also took an exam in physiology which he passed. This was mainly because the government gave money for each student that passed the exam, so the headmaster was inclined to enter as many pupils as possible. Unfortunately, monetary problems intervened and the cost of the apprenticeship was too much for Sarah Wells to bear. H.G. Wells left the chemist and his enjoyable lessons with Mr. Byatt to take up yet another apprenticeship with yet another draper, Hyde's Drapery Store in Southsea, a quaint seaside town in the county of Hampshire. Ironically, Sleepy Southsea is a town with surprising literary credentials, as it is the birthplace of that extraordinary detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the great sleuth's creator, came to Southsea as a young doctor of medicine, but unfortunately few patients called at his consulting rooms. Never one to sit idly as he waited for custom, Conan Doyle started to write his Sherlock Holmes stories, and the rest, as they say, is history. But there was no such inactivity for the young H.G. Wells. He stayed two long years at this drapery store, often working 13-hour days, and they were far from being happy times. He would use his experiences later as the basis for his successful novel, Kips, which detailed the drab life of a draper's assistant and ended as a critique on the distribution of the world's wealth. The endless drudgery of his apprenticeship didn't suit Wells' style of working. He was able to labour incredibly hard in short, sporadic bursts and then would drift off into daydreams and tiredness. His brain needed nourishment for his thousands of unanswered questions to life, the universe and everything. A drapery store was definitely not going to provide such answers. One Sunday, H.G. Wells walked the 17 miles from his workplace in Southsea to Up Park in Bromley where his mother was still a housekeeper. He threatened suicide if she didn't pull him out of the apprenticeship, pleading with her to release him from the boredom of silk handling and money accounting. Luckily for H.G. Wells, a saviour came in the person of his former teacher, Mr. Horace Byatt, from Midhurst Grammar School. The potential of his one-time student had intrigued him and he offered Sarah Wells the chance to release H.G. into his care as a student assistant at the respectable sum of £20 a year. Mr. Byatt, through H.G. Wells' amazing ability to soak up and acquire knowledge, started winning monetary award after monetary award for putting his student up for every exam possible on a wide variety of subjects. 
He was effectively the circus master, using his star attraction as a performing monkey to rake in the money. However, whatever motives Mr. Byatt may have had for pushing Wells to higher and higher academic success, it was speedily creating a self-confident and intellectual young man who began to see some future in the world around him. No longer were there suicide thoughts, as he loved every second of the learning he was getting. Textbooks replaced fabrics, and smiles replaced frowns as he devoured any topic that he was given. At this time, there was a teacher shortage in England, and students who were passing enough exams at high grades were invited on a free scholarship to study teaching at London University's Normal School of Science in South Kensington. This establishment was an amalgamation of the Royal College of Chemistry and the Government School of Mines and Sciences Applied to the Arts, funded by donations from the Great Exhibition of 1851. The Great Exhibition was a huge self-financing showcase of culture and industry on display in Hyde Park, London. It was set up to let the rest of the world know what Great Britain had and could achieve in specific fields of endeavour. It was the first of many such exhibitions, which were later renamed World Fairs, and was a great success due to the foresight of Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, whose idea it had been. The whole of the Great Exhibition was housed in a specially constructed glass building called the Crystal Palace, which was designed by a committee led by the popular figure of Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Brunel, like Prince Albert, was a forward thinker and was the mastermind behind the Great Western Railways and transatlantic shipping, building the first ocean liners. He was most famous for designing the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol, England, which still stands today. The Great Exhibition not only funded the joining of the two science and arts colleges in London, but also funded the building of three famous museums, which can still be visited in London today. The Natural History Museum, the Science Museum, and the Victoria and Albert Museum. Because of the generous donations from the Great Exhibition, H.G. Wells was one of the lucky students who was singled out for a scholarship to the Normal School of Science where his education to become a teacher was paid for. Aside from the prospect of not having to fund his own lessons, his main draw for attending was the fact that this learned college boasted the biological brilliance of T. H. Huxley as chair of natural history. Huxley was a famous advocate and supporter of Charles Darwin's The Origin of the Species thesis, which most scientists had initially scoffed at when it was first published in 1859. Darwin's landmark writing blew open the doors to biology, astronomy, chemistry and geology and allowed philosophical thinking to form a basis for the eternal secrets of life itself. It laid the foundation for the modern theory of evolution and the principle of common descent by proposing natural selection as a mechanism. T. H. Huxley became legendary as a defender of this theory, with Darwin himself staying out of the much publicised debates because of ill health. Huxley 
would be hero-worshipped by H.G. Wells and was the sort of scientist and forward-thinking individual that Wells would aspire to become. Under Huxley, Wells was an attentive and intelligent pupil and enjoyed his studies. Elsewhere, he fared less well, having one of his physics projects preserved for years after he'd left, in order to show new pupils the very worst that they could do. Living in cramped conditions, in an overcrowded student house in Westbourne Park, London, Wells soon leaned more and more towards the writing and debating sides of his studies. He joined the Fabian Society when he'd just turned 20, after his views developed progressively into socialist ideology. The Fabian Society was a British socialist intellectual movement which included such famous names as Irish playwright and Nobel Prize winner George Bernard Shaw, and the founder of the Suffragettes and Crusader for the Women's Right to Vote, Emmeline Pankhurst, to name but two. The society was set up to advance socialist ideals and ideas into England. Socialism in Europe had been prevalent since the French Revolution, when the exploited lower classes overthrew their aristocratic upper-class leaders fighting for liberty and equality. The Fabian Society was a modernised version of this in that they were utopian socialists. They focused on general welfare rather than individualism, preferring cooperation instead of competition, rejecting the class struggle ethic suggesting that the wealthy should join with the poor to form a perfect and equal society. H.G. Wells set up his own magazine to further his literary and socialist ambitions and named it the Science School Journal. In it, he would often write under pseudonyms such as Septimus Brown and Walker Glockenhammer so that it would appear that it wasn't just one person contributing. One of his short stories, The Chronic Argonauts, was an early version of his later novel, The Time Machine. The editor of the Pall Mall Gazette, a popular regional newspaper of the time, paid Wells to write a book and theatre reviews that brought in an extra income, which he sent home to his parents. His writings and socialist activities took prominence over his studies and his lecturers all noted that he'd become lazy and less attentive. All around him, the world was changing rapidly. The second phase of the Industrial Revolution was well underway, which involved significant developments within the electrical, chemical, petroleum and steel industries. This in turn caused more unemployment and a real divide between capitalism and labour, between worker and employer, and between trade union and individuals. Victorian Britain presided over by Her Majesty Queen Victoria, the nation's longest serving monarch, was changing, as was the Great British Empire, which was rapidly falling into a decline. Stubbornly, Britain refused to be hurried or flustered by such change, but the social climate was definitely undergoing a transformation, and H.G. Wells was being swept up and dragged along by the undercurrent of the developing future. During his last few terms at the Normal School of Science, he stayed with his Aunt Mary in Euston Road, an important thoroughfare of the time, and part of the new road from Paddington to Islington, which was built as a bypass over the northern fields of London. 
because of the continued growth of Britain's capital city, Euston Road is now regarded as being at the very heart of central London. It was here, staying in blissful peace and comfort away from the mass of dirty student lodgers and evil landladies, that he first met his future wife, his cousin, Isabel Mary Wells. They instantly fell in love with each other and began a courtship that was only interrupted by his sudden departure from London. H.G. Wells left the Normal School of Science after failing an exam in 1887 and, at 21 years of age, without a degree, he decided to try for a teaching post in Holt, a small country town in Wales. His lack of a degree was overlooked because of the size of the school and he became the new assistant schoolmaster. As soon as he arrived there, he yearned to return to London. Holt was overlooked by giant gas works, was as grim as the conditions inside the school, where pupils were physically beaten and the boarding facilities required three students to share one bed. In his short time there, he did meet a pretty young teacher who made him forget the image he had in his head of his cousin Isabel. His tenure at Holt School in Wales was cut short when during a coaching session for the football team he was badly fouled by a pupil, an act which Wells would later claim was premeditated. Immediately afterwards, Wells was violently sick, became delirious and began to cough up blood. He ignored a doctor's advice to rest and returned to teach the next day. Unfortunately, his condition worsened and a doctor was called to examine him. He was diagnosed with a large internal hemorrhage, a badly damaged kidney and evidence of tuberculosis. Wells was advised to leave teaching immediately and spend some time convalescing. So he arranged to return to Up Park, the sprawling mansion where his mother was housekeeper. Constant smaller hemorrhages and weakened lungs left him exhausted and he never really recovered until the best part of a decade had passed. Again, because of his invalided status, he began delving deeper into books and into himself and concentrated on writing. Returning to London in 1889, fortune smiled upon Wells as he landed a post at a private college called Henley House School, where all the boarders were children of professional and privileged families. He began courting his cousin, Isabel Mary Wells, once again, and although they were poles apart in personality and intellect, Wells believed that he needed to be in a stable marriage and wanted to satisfy his cravings for love and sex. He supplemented his income by teaching pupils via a correspondence course and eventually, after passing yet more exams to become a Bachelor of Science, he was offered a teaching post at the University Correspondence College in Cambridge. Just before he took up his job in Cambridge, H.G. Wells married Isabel Mary Wells on October the 31st, 1891 at Wandsworth Parish Church, South London. It was Halloween, and this would be the time, years later, for the infamous American radio broadcast of his novel, The War of the Worlds. Within a few months, H.G. Wells grew weary of his new wife. They'd moved to a house in the suburbs of London, 
and Wells admitted that after a long engagement of genuine commitment, he was disappointed by married life and quickly started to look elsewhere for the sexual fulfilment he craved. His most notable affair was with one of his students, Miss Amy Catherine Robbins. She began to take private lessons with him to encourage her studies, and they became more than friends. She was attractive, full of life, and far more intellectual than Isabel, and Wells really did fall head over heels in love with her. So much so that in 1895, when Wells suffered another severe hemorrhage with constant coughing attacks forcing him to rest again, all he could think about was his beautiful student. Dragging his weak frame from his sickbed, H.G. Wells left his home with Isabel to move in with his mistress in a flat in Mornington Place, London. He rechristened Amy Catherine Robbins as just plain Jane, as neither of them liked her given Catholic name. Wells kicked against organised religion all his life and found an ally in his new love. Jane herself had been stricken with tuberculosis and both she and Wells weren't expected to live an overly long life. This may have been one of the reasons they were so passionate about each other in the beginning and determined to squeeze every last drop of happiness out of life. They were married immediately after an inevitable divorce from Isabel. This period of new love and a new life seemed to inspire H.G. Wells and he produced his great literary works during this time. Each of his amazing novels covered the four sciences that had been linked so closely together when Darwin's theory of evolution had been published. The Time Machine was his first published novel and reflected Wells' political views. His vision of the future was a parable on what would happen if a capitalist society kept its rigid class structures in place forever. An amateur inventor, never named but believed to be based on H.G. Wells himself, builds a machine that can break through the fourth dimension and travels far into the future. Here, he finds a peaceful, utopian society, not too dissimilar to how the socialist Fabian society saw the world becoming, filled with happy, loving humans. However, this illusion is shattered when the scientist learns that the three-tiered class structure of Victorian times has given way to just two branches of the human race. The wealthy upper class appeared to have evolved into these ineffectual and intellectually retarded creatures, whilst the downtrodden working class has devolved into bestial, albino, ape-like creatures who keep the machinery running underground that allows their so-called betters to keep their peaceful existence. The twist is that the working class have become cannibals and, in order to keep the machinery running, require the food they eat to be the upper classes themselves. It's not only a parable on the futile nature of the class system in Victorian Britain, but also a satirical attack on the Industrial Revolution whereby machinery was enabling the upper classes to live better by exploiting the working classes into cheap labour and, worse still, unemployment. H.G. Wells was instantly compared to Jules Verne because of his marrying of science, adventures and romance. 
Verne was a French writer of prolific renown, whose books included Journey to the Centre of the Earth, From the Earth to the Moon, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and Around the World in 80 Days. The difference between Wells and Verne is that Verne described adventures and sights with the emphasis on excitement, whereas Wells wrote about the destiny and the actions of such adventures. Wells wrote from a scientific background as opposed to Verne's love of romance and travel. After the success of The Time Machine, Wells was able to leave teaching behind and provide more adequately for his family in Bromley. He and Jane moved from their rented flat to a house of their own called Heatherley in the wealthy surroundings of Worcester Park in the London borough of Sutton. Wells' ailing mother-in-law moved in with them and Jane became nurse not only to her husband but also to her mother. H.G. Wells' next big success was The Island of Dr. Moreau, which posed an interesting question. What would be the result of science without ethics? It was a Frankenstein story of a scientist trying to play God by creating his own species. The point of the novel was to examine what it is to be human and the reasoning behind what made humanity tick. Its images of half-man, half-animal creatures, a mad scientist, a castaway on a desert island and various mutant half-breeds would propel Wells into the Super League as far as the public were concerned. Eminent scientists, on the other hand, vilified his ideas and musings as nothing more than fanciful. The Frankenstein idea was an apt one for Wells to use as the author of Frankenstein itself was inspired by events around her, as was Wells. Mary Shelley, the author of this classic tale, found her inspiration for the tale of a brilliant doctor creating a living being from various parts of dead people through the early studies of electricity in much the same way as Wells studied the effects and encroachment of the Industrial Revolution and Darwin's theory of evolution. Wells was grateful that he could command a hefty advance for his next novel, The Invisible Man, which featured a character corrupted by naked power, quite literally. An albino scientist discovers a way to strip the colour from his flesh and bones in order to create invisibility. The scientist starts out as a corrupt man and becomes even more corrupt as the story continues. It challenges man's behaviour when given unaccountable supremacy. For Jane Wells, her role became that of a sounding board. After the flush of initial sexual excess, they'd become ill-matched in the bedroom, but became closer in intellect and personality. In short, they understood each other a lot better than anybody else understood them. She was a strong and opinionated woman who Wells could rely upon to be his sternest critic. She was also his copyist, secretary and housekeeper, as well as being the one who entertained guests when famous friends like Charlie Chaplin and Noel Coward frequently came to visit. Wells' most famous book was published in 1898 and had originally appeared as a nine-part series in the English periodical Pearson's Magazine. He used the critical reaction to the story to enhance and change it before it was released in book form as The War of the Worlds. Using Darwin's theory of evolution as a starting point again, he wanted to prick the pompous balloon of ego that Victorian Britain was living under. 
Wells felt that the nation he was part of had the notion, because of the amazing feats of advancement that had taken place under the reign of Queen Victoria, that they were the highest and most intellectual order of life on the planet. Consequently, HG used a more advanced race from another planet, the so-called Red Planet of Mars. It's only through a caprice of nature that humanity survives, proving that Mother Nature is in fact much more powerful than all of humanity put together. It was also a damning verdict and scathing attack on the colonialization of different cultures and different countries by the all-conquering British Empire. Again, as in his earlier novels, he turned the tables on the ruling classes. How would they like it if they were the ones being taken over by a different race? One of the reasons for the book's success was its believability. The British Empire was under constant threat of attack from Germany at the time, with German troops amassing across the Channel. This tapping into the fear of the unknown was the very same effect that Orson Welles would use in 1938 with the impending approach of the Second World War, scaring the American nation. H.G. Wells went to a lot of trouble to base the action on real locations in England, whereas other novels tended to fictionalise them. Orson Welles, perceptive to this feeling of familiarity that increases believability, used exactly the same trick in his audio adaptation with such places as New Jersey and New York City taking the place of London and surrounding Eastern England. After 1898 and the giant success of The War of the Worlds novel, H.G. Wells was able to command advances of huge sums of money for his books. He took a holiday with his wife, which called in on France and Italy, before returning home to another bout of illness that laid him low. Upon medical advice, he was told to cut back on his writing and move out of the city's heavy climate and unavoidable stresses. He and Jane searched for a house for months, but couldn't find one to their liking, so they had one built for them instead. The customised grand estate called Spade House, near the picturesque village of Sandgate in the countryside of Kent, known as the Garden of England, was where the Wells family would live for the next decade. There was a magnificent view of the English countryside and the gentle sea, which helped Wells relax and continue working. The First Men on the Moon, another novel, was published in 1901 as a reversed sequel to The War of the Worlds. In this story, 
a lunar-dwelling race of intelligent insects known as the Selenites get unintentionally killed off as a result of a misunderstanding by the invasion force of humanity. Again, on another level, Wells aimed this book at the rigid structure of pure socialism. Although an advocate of the very same beliefs, Wells disagreed with the notion that an individual should be sacrificed for the greater good. H.G. Wells and his wife Jane began their family in earnest when their first son, George Philip Wells, was born in 1901. In 1903, Jane gave birth to a second son, Frank Richard Wells. Because of the birth of his first son, Wells became very interested in the future and what it would hold. His novel, Anticipations was his most successful to date and foresaw many things, like the dispersion of residents from cities to suburbs because of the usage of trains and cars, and greater sexual freedom for men and women eroding the moral restrictions of the day. It outlined society in the future due to mechanical and scientific advances. H.G. Wells was such a prolific writer that he continued to amaze the reading public with his novels such as Kipps, The Sea Lady, In the Days of the Comet and The War in the Air, whilst also writing many personal novels which detailed his own life, his views, his hopes and fears for mankind and his personal manifestos such as A Modern Utopia, Mankind in the Making, Socialism and the Family, and An Englishman Looks at the World. Wells considered that his home life had become sexually dull, and he began taking lovers, which his wife, Jane, seemed to ignore. She became, in his eyes, the perfect wife in her approach to him. She looked after him, she worked for him, and she let him get away with whatever he wanted to get away with. Ultimately, she loved him, and professed to understand his roving desires. His affairs would continue for the rest of his life, and were varied and endless. H.G. had two major extramarital affairs in his life that stand out. The first was with Amber Reeves, the daughter of a wealthy New Zealand High Commissioner. Her father was part of the Fabian Society and encouraged his daughter to study the writings of H.G. Wells. When they met, they lusted after each other immediately and began an intense physical relationship that was known to her parents Jane Wells and the general public. In 1909, Amber became pregnant and was instantly married to a family friend. There's no confirmation to prove that this was a child fathered by H.G. Wells, but the family lived nearby and were paid frequent visits from H.G. and Jane Wells. It's believed that the scandalous novel Anne Veronica is based on Amber Reeves and her passionate relationship with Wells, depicting a liberal young independent woman at a time when no women were independent, who defied the conventions of the day by taking a lover, being open about her sexual exploits and becoming a fierce suffragette. The 
The second major affair took place after he uprooted his family from their house in Kent to settle across the Channel in France for a year, before returning to England to buy Eastern Park Rectory, renaming it Eastern Glebe, in the fashionable London borough of Chelsea. This time he fell for the fellow writer and Fabian Society member Rebecca West. Their relationship was passionately stormy and resulted in Anthony West, an illegitimate child, being born in 1914. The relationship ended in 1923 when she married, but every detail of it was poured into his work during that decade. Well seemed insatiable and even tried to rekindle the dead embers of a love affair with his first wife, Isabel, when he visited her at her poultry farm in Tyford, Berkshire. And although she rebuffed his advances, they remained very close until her sudden death years later, when her former husband was helping to build a house for her twilight years. The events of World War I, which spanned the years 1914 to 1918, saw Wells split into two personalities. His socialist self would condemn a war and believed in rational progress rather than the progress of brute force favoured by the German army. The Fabian Society urged soldiers to revolt, but Wells saw the conflict as a battle between socialism and evil. A victory for imperialistic Germany would echo back to the heyday of the British Empire, when an all-conquering nation would effectively trample all over the world. So, in a direct reversal to his socialist self, he became a staunch advocator of the British war effort and hoped this war would help create a better understanding to prevent future wars, leading to an establishment of a world state. The famous phrase, the war to end all wars, was his. Due to his involvement in the First World War, H.G. Wells fell out with the original founder of the Fabian Society, the noted Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw. Their friendship was one of biting criticism and then soothing praise throughout their respective lives from then on. It was the archetypical love-hate relationship in print, in public and in private. H.G. Wells' amazingly resilient and forgiving wife Jane was swiftly taken away from him in 1927. Diagnosed with incurable cancer of the uterus, she died the day before their son Frank was to marry. H.G. Wells had been by her side throughout the few months from diagnosis to death and was consumed by grief. The last 20 years of H.G. Wells' life saw him try to force his thinking onto the world, whether or not the world wanted to listen. His frequent pontifications on peace and world unity saw him personified as a dictator. During both of the world wars that Wells lived through, he became a very political speaker and advocated a world state where peace would reign but his intolerant attitude to anyone who criticised his romantic vision made him come across like a hazy reflection of Adolf Hitler. His long-term affair with the critic Odette Kuhn increased his downturn in popularity 
when their relationship was barely concealed in the newspaper articles, published writings and sensational tell-all articles in magazines. He also managed to meet and interview two of the most famous world leaders of the time, visiting the Kremlin in Russia to meet Premier Stalin and then journeying to Washington in the United States of America to meet President Roosevelt. His aim was to see what could be gleaned from meeting these two opposing forces. His vision of a world at peace depended on them both following similar lines in their thinking, even if their politics and beliefs were not entirely matching. In 1938, he allowed his most famous novel, The War of the Worlds, to be dramatised by the Mercury Theatre on air, led by 23-year-old Orson Welles for America Radio. Orson Welles was a revolutionary figure in the audio and visual mediums of radio and film, in much the same way as H.G. Wells was in print. In America, 39 million people tuned into the radio every night, and most programmes were usually interrupted by news flashes of the increasing approach of World War II in Europe. Orson Welles picked up on this habit of radio broadcasters and so structured his radio play to be told as news flashes, interrupting music. He also scheduled it to coincide with the time when most listeners would be channel surfing. The most popular show on radio was Chase and Sanborn, which starred Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. It was a ventriloquist act on radio. There was absolutely no chance of seeing the mouth move. At the same time in every show, the ventriloquist act made way for a musical interlude, and this was the moment when most listeners would switch channels to see what else was on. On that fateful night before Halloween in 1938, the majority of them were greeted with a news report by Carl Phillips describing a strange crash landing of an unidentified flying object at Grover's Mill, New Jersey, USA. As the drama unfolded, listeners began to believe that this really was either an invasion force from the planet Mars or a surprise attack by the German army. Many people were hurt in the chaos that ensued. Even locals at Grover's Mill were seen to fire shots in the general direction that they thought the invasion force was coming from. An unnamed source from Washington, played by Mercury Theatre actor Kenny Del Mar, issued a stern warning of Martian invaders and the need for calm in a voice not a million miles away from President Roosevelt. The army was put on emergency call, and many of the original listeners didn't stay glued to their radios long enough to hear that the second half of the broadcast developed into a normal dramatisation of extracts read from the sole survivor's diary. Orson Welles initially denied any intent to scare listeners into thinking this was an actual broadcast of a live event, but, later in life, confessed to using it to show the power of the radio medium. At the time, radio was in its heyday and television was in its infancy. The powers of the airwaves were only a decade old and still presenting new and exciting experimental productions for millions of listeners. They were used to hearing the reassuring voice of their president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, giving his so-called fireside chats beamed into their homes regularly. So, when they heard a voice similar to their respected president, 
urging them to stay calm, they all immediately panicked. Because of the clever simulation, using sound effects combined with skillful acting and editing, listeners really did think they were hearing an actual news report of a real invasion force from the planet Mars. Traffic jams built up on major roads as people fled from their homes and tried to leave the cities mentioned in the broadcast. Other people hid in cellars and gathered loved ones together for one last night together. Others armed themselves for attack and wrapped their heads in wet towels to avoid the effects of the creeping Martian gas that was being described so vividly. It's reported that some people even committed suicide. Such was their fear of the unknown. News of the panic generated a national scandal and Orson Welles was forced very early the next morning to give an apologetic statement to the mass media. However, one noted critic in the New York Tribune newspaper, Dorothy Thompson, bucked the trend by praising the Halloween hoax broadcast. She foresaw, as Orson Welles did, how the new medium could manipulate the general public via mass communications. She saw danger in the fact that the people had believed what they'd heard and could be so easily taken in by it. She said that, albeit unwittingly, Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre of the Air had made one of the most fascinating and important demonstrations of all time. They proved that a few effective voices, accompanied by sound effects, could convince masses of perfectly normal, sensible people of a totally unreasonable, completely fantastic proposition so as to create a nationwide panic. It was noted that Adolf Hitler had managed to scare all of Europe to its knees a month before the broadcast but he at least had an army and an air force to back up his shrieking words. Mr Orson Welles scared thousands into demoralisation with nothing at all. Before his Mercury Theatre troupe had been signed to the radio station, Orson Welles had already caused controversy by staging a voodoo-themed version of Macbeth with a largely African-American cast and a version of Julius Caesar that used the imagery and costumes of a fascist Italian dictatorship. His version of the War of the Worlds not only advanced his public recognition but also secured the ailing radio program a big name sponsor. He used the stage to get to radio and from the radio he jumped ship to the cinema. It was here that he made his magnum opus, the oft-voted best film of all time, Citizen Kane, which followed the same format as his groundbreaking broadcast of The War of the Worlds. H.G. Wells' reaction to this radio adaptation of his celebrated work mirrored the public attitude, with the added worry that the majority of people thought he'd been in on the elaborate hoax. From his home in London, Wells considered taking legal action and stated that he had only authorised the use of his novel because he thought it was just going to be a broadcast reading rather than a dramatised event. His rage subsided, however, when more important developments drove this story from the headlines of the newspapers, namely the demands and frightening advances of Adolf Hitler and his Nazi army. Of course, the whole War of the Worlds incident did H.G. Wells no harm at all, as his book sales rose healthily because of it. But he was given to petulant outbursts that he often backtracked from at a later date. 
H.G. Wells still harbouring a galloping inferiority complex because of his poor background, contradicted his intellectual statements on a regular basis. He hated the class system of Great Britain, but maybe that was because he was inextricably bound by it. He loathed organised religion, but perhaps that was because it was forced upon him as a child. He advocated free love and the abolishment of strict Victorian morals and values, but then that could have been because this would allow him to continue with his scandalous affairs and complicated love life unhindered. Controversy would continue to surround H.G. Wells, the War of the Worlds and the Mercury Theatre's version of it for the rest of his life and even after his death. As a result of the Halloween hoax, it's alleged that the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was first received with scepticism by the American public when reports began to be broadcast of the devastation, as they didn't want to be fooled by another hoax story when the unbelievable news of the catastrophe reached them. Amazingly enough, despite the chaos it caused in America, the drama was rewritten to apply to other locations and rebroadcast with similar results. In 1944, a broadcast in San Diego, Chile, South America, resulted in widespread panic and fear, with the mobilization of armed troops by the governor of the republic. But by far the worst happened not long after H.G. Wells had died, when in 1949, a radio reenactment on El Comercio in Quito, Ecuador, again in South America, caused havoc. Altered to fit the region, using the technique of familiar settings to draw in the audience, this play was broadcast using pitch-perfect imitations of prominent politicians, government officials and even the mayor who was heard to urge the men to stay and fight whilst letting their women and children flee for their lives. The broadcast became more sensational than the Orson Welles production when a whole city panicked and rioting began. The radio station was alerted and a plea for calm was broadcast along with the confession that this was a premeditated prank. Unfortunately, this embarrassed and enraged those who believed in it and the radio station was soon surrounded by a seething mob. Pleas for immediate help from the radio station to the local authorities went unheeded because police and local army units had been sent out into the surrounding countryside to do battle with the Martians. By the time the police and army were recalled, the radio station had been set on fire. Twenty people died, fifteen were seriously injured, three officials charged with allowing the broadcast to go ahead were arrested and thrown in jail, and £200,000 worth of damage had been caused to the city. The power of the War of the Worlds lived on.
1940, H.G. Wells was on a lecture tour of America and he met up with his namesake Orson Wells, but with an E, for a radio interview when both men found themselves in the same city for respective speaking engagements. Both seemed mystified by the outcry that the original War of the Worlds broadcast had caused and were jovial and comfortable in each other's company. It was also in 1940, as the Second World War was really beginning to gather pace, that H.G. Wells came to see his horrible vision of the future come true. In 1936, he'd participated with a Hollywood film version of his novel, The Shape of Things to Come, in which he dramatically predicted the start of a world war in Europe, and also the massive bomb-dropping air raids on British cities, which resulted in hundreds of innocent casualties. He was to be proved right yet again. H.G. Wells found little solace in his predictions coming true, as it seemed to be only the ones where humanity would continue along the wrong course and wind up destroying itself that would prove to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yet Wells resolutely refused to move out of London during the entirety of World War II referring constantly to the diary of his time during World War I, which he'd fictionalised as Mr. Brittling Sees It Through. Herbert George Wells saw it through until he died peacefully in his sleep at his home in Regent Park, London on August the 13th, 1946. He'd been suffering from cancer for a long time in the same stoic manner that he'd battled all of his life with various medical complaints. On his own request, he was cremated and his son, George Philip Wells from his marriage to Jane and Anthony West from his affair with Rebecca West scattered his ashes over the English Channel between the Isle of Wight and St Albans Head. H.G. Wells had spent many long hours looking at the sea and marvelling at where it might take him were he a fit and healthy man. To him, the sea created endless relaxation and limitless possibilities. It was a mystery, too deep to explore properly. It was feared and loved by equal measure. It could be angry and it could be calm. But all in all, it was universally viewed as a thing of great power and adventure. H.G. Wells could easily have been described in the very same way. A memorial service for H.G. Wells, notable because of the famous philosophers, writers, scientists and politicians who attended, took place at the Royal Institution in London, and the legacy of his writing, his vision and his teachings still live on today. Although he predicted the breakdown of society, the destruction of civilization and many savage and bloody wars, 
there was always an element of hope and salvation in his work. It was only in his last years, when illness eroded his optimism, that he gave in to a pessimistic outlook on mankind's descent into depravity and destruction. A new wave of criticism paints H. G. Wells as being something of a racist, without taking account of the fact that modern sensibilities are shocked by what were, in Victorian times, stereotypical descriptions of ethnic and racial groups. Wells essentially believed in the equality of all races, but had little time for either religion or people who didn't fit into his worldview of an elite state. His words would come back to haunt him during the advancement of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party, with their idealized worldview and their insistence on purity in the human race by purging what they thought to be evil. The Holocaust resulting in the systematic execution of over six million Jews during World War II, was something that H. G. Wells would never have advocated. But his narrow-minded socialist agenda sounds far too akin to Adolf Hitler's horrific views for it to be accepted today. Sadly for Wells, his legacy hasn't been kept alive by his own personal published propaganda and philosophies on a world ruled by reason and peaceful unity, such as mankind in the making, the salvaging of civilization, the outlook for Homo sapiens, and mind at the end of its tether. His lasting appeal still lies in his scientific adventure stories such as the Time Machine, the Island of Dr. Moreau, the Invisible Man, and ultimately, the War of the Worlds. These fascinating and fearful tales are still read and loved today, inspiring films, television series, stage plays and radio shows. H.G. Wells, for all his love of science and socialism, knew first and foremost the fundamental joy of reading something that stimulates and excites the brain and the heart. And it is for this much treasured legacy that he'll never be forgotten. No one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that this world was being watched keenly and closely by intelligences greater than man's and yet as mortal as his own. That as men busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complexity, men went to and fro over this globe about their little affairs, serene in their assurance of their empire over matter. It is possible that the infusoria under the microscope do the same. No one gave a thought to the older worlds of space as sources of human danger, or thought of them only to dismiss the idea of life upon them as impossible 